All right, everybody, happy Monday afternoon to you and yours. I'm sitting down with, uh, I'm going to sound like, um, I guess, Wally Coyote right now because I'm sitting next to a pure genius. Mm. 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 He's an actor, producer, writer, and CEO. CEO. CEO of Collective Development Incorporated, the one and only Mr. D.J. Perry. Oh, my goodness. You got me out of my hole, and I'm actually here and <laughs> engaged in technology. How about that? How about yeah. that? Wait, so, something else I want to add to your resume, because I'm dying to know this. I, I think you are also a fellow Bigfoot lover. Mm-hmm. I love all mysteries. I really do. I think from a, a very young age, you know, those things that we can't quite define, you know, the UFOs, the Bigfoots, the Loch Ness Monsters, the ghosts, <laughs> you know, I, I think that stuff is uh, part of storytelling. You Absolutely. know, those are the That's stories true. that have passed down because, you know, fear is one of the things, obviously, that they'd sit around the campfires and tell. So. Yeah, I'm fascinated by that. <laughs> I, I, I actually, I wrote a script uh, years ago uh, uh, called Savage that was actually done for the Chiller TV or something like that. Okay. Uh, we optioned it to a friend of mine out of Ohio and they produced it. And, and uh, you know, so that was kind of fun to see. You know, I think Marty Cove from... Cobra Kai oh, was in yeah, it, yeah. Tony Becker from the Waltons, and forgot who else I had in there. But, you know, who doesn't like a good Bigfoot movie, right? Hey, I still I have an ongoing argument with uh, actually uh, one of my past guests for many years who I've become very good friends with, and he swears Bigfoot is fake. So I constantly get messages on Facebook or text messages how Bigfoot is fake, and it mm -hmm. breaks my heart. Well, you know, the cl there's that classic footage from back in the day, you know, that they claim might have been a female or whatnot. Mm -hmm. But you know how, like, even our films now, they can up res it. They clone the pixels and can take stuff up into 2-4K resolution. And I recently saw some of that footage where they brought the detail out. You know, that's way before Stan Winston and, you know, special <laughs> effects even got their hold in Hollywood. So... Either somebody was very cutting edge on their hoaxing, mm. or you got to consider what you're seeing, I guess. There you go. So, I've always thought. considered it. That's I've right. always considered it. There you go. So, all right, so we, we ran through your list of titles. Uh, actor, producer, writer. The CEO part naturally came later. But, uh, but out of being an actor, producer, and writer, like which one was truly the first thing that you got started with the ceo was the first thing Stop because, it. yeah yeah because we formed collective development initially my partner jeff kennedy and i to try to sell some scripts in hollywood okay so we wrote some properties <laughs> and we had some near options and sales but it's hard you know even mm -hmm. to this day i've only had a handful of options and sales you know to different companies and after, you know, beating your head against the wall with a couple of almost sales. Right. Um, I had already been acting in a few different films. And let's try to do this ourselves. I think there was a couple of drinks involved with it sitting around and <laughs> l lamenting the rejection letters or we're not accepting anything at this time or no unsolicited material. Oh, my God, we got to pull another agent or a, a attorney on board. And it was just finally like, maybe we should just, let's just do our own. So being too dumb to know that we probably weren't up to par at that point to do it. <laughs> but, you know, you got it. Cur courage and stupidity. It's a fine line. It's a fine line. You said a mouthful there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so when did this start then? When did collective uh, development start? 97, I believe. Really? That long? 1997. Oh, yeah. Because um, let's see. Night Chills with a K, which was our first movie, was probably... We, we were filming in 98. You okay. know, so... 
I guess, you know, when you look back, it's like uh, we probably got a little impatient, you know, but you start getting those letters of people saying no or we're not accepting at this time. And it's like, I guess I'm not a person that, uh, you know, takes no very long. I was always the kid organizing the BB gun wars, the catch to the flag, <laughs> backyard football. And so, uh, you know, organizing people towards a common goal, that was already something that kind of came natural. So, you know, and that's the thing, you're, you were rattling off those titles. Before the filmmaking, you know, being a soccer player and coach, I played here and overseas in Scandinavia, wow. Denmark, Sweden. And uh, then being a martial artist, which is really trying to bring out the best in each individual. Mm -hmm. And then I was a camp counselor for several summers, which, uh, you know, film sets, especially away on location, it's a lot like running a camp. So <laughs> it's funny how camp counselor, martial artist and soccer player and coach, the teamwork aspect of it, uh, all really all kind of came together to give me a unique skill set that. I'm not sure they teach at a lot of film schools, you know. Probably not. Probably not. But so, I, being the fact you guys really started this in '97, I mean, that was way. That was like I, when we were talking about this before. That was when I first started getting on the internet and started my AOL account. So, yeah. Uh, at which we both still proudly use AOL. That's right. Uh, <laughs> we, so uh, how hard was it then to really be doing this whole process of making movies and, and, and distributing them especially there wasn't well, no streaming know, or nothing well it's always been hard and matter of fact we shot on film and that's the thing is you hear these hipsters now but oh i miss film man i miss film and it's like you have no <laughs> idea the craziness you're sending your only copy <gasps> through the mail you're praying that it arrives and then you're, you know, hoping that the emulsion doesn't screw up with the chemical process or they don't rip a negative when drying it, which mm. happened to us with one of our Civil War films. There was, you know, a day that was like a $7,000 special effects explosions and everything. And the negative got ripped and they offered to replace the film stock. So we ended up removing all our, our footage from there and taking it to another lab neither of them are probably in existence but i'm not going to throw anybody under the bus but it, you know it was a different age now you yeah know, your, your thing goes to dit and you almost have like three different copies you know in a very short period of time and wow. if there's any mistakes it, it's right there you know a lot of times mm -hmm. the software with these cameras and everything it's it's incredible now and so you know, I'm a person that doesn't miss the film days because of that. Sure. I can imagine. You know, well, you know, you're responsible for all this money and how you're going to get all these people back to a certain place. And mm -hmm. I mean, this Wicked Spring film that I'm speaking of, we took over Fort Pickett military base. We had hundreds of reenactors in the World War II barracks. We had mm -hmm. all our cast and crew in the officer's quarters. We ate in the mess halls. We partied in the officers' clubs off hours. And, uh, you know, it's, it, you know, it's a, it's a task. You know, each one of these things, you know, when we start out, it's like, oh, my goodness. But, you know, a little bit at a time, and it takes, it takes a team. That's the thing is that when I, we talk about all these things, it, it really does take a large team of creative people, and collective development has that. So it's awesome. Yeah. So, so were like going back to your younger days before you went to like the world of soccer and martial arts and things like that. Mm -hmm. Were you were you doing any acting at all or writing or? You know, so if, from a young age, uh, we were very creative. We grew up with woods around us, so we were building forts and playing mm -hmm. commando and playing. You know, Star Wars came out when I was seven. That was a that was a changer. You know, so we're the same age. Yeah. Couch cushions became the Millennium <clears throat> Falcon mm -hmm. Star Wars album dropped the needle. Uh, <laughs> you know, and and so then it, it led to the tape recorders and the sound effects albums and doing like radio dramas. And then mm -hmm. when the camcorder came out, 
uh, you know, which my dad bought. It was an expensive piece of equipment. It was for capturing family memories. This mm -hmm. is not a toy. And, you know, I begged him to let us do some like, um, they're more like, MT well, they're like Saturday Night Live skits or whatnot. <laughs> And I think what got him to say yes is we had some teachers in high school started letting us, instead of a book report or final exam, let us make a movie. Okay. Well, but the thing is, too, we had no editing equipment. So we right. had to do one take, shoot every scene, every shot in order, you know. So mm -hmm. it was done that way with, with somebody pressing the you know play on boom box <laughs> at the same time so you know kids have it so much easier now it's like oh my goodness what they have in their phone is so far beyond both in camera editing equipment right you know garage band all this stuff <laughs> and it's like they'll never know the pain of sitting in front of a don't. radio with a blank cassette waiting to push record and play at the same time to get your favorite song oh, for right. hours waiting for it. Uh, and then the DJ would, that would talk too long over the beginning <laughs> of it. Yeah. Damn it. That was stairway to heaven. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. I, I get, so I, it's a funny story. I still remember to this day. And, and I tell people, um, my, like, it was like one of my first days of kindergarten. Like my obsession was when I was a kid, still to this day, the Planet of the Apes. Mm -hmm. And I went into that kindergarten class, and my way of making friends was, I'm going to remake the Planet of the Apes movie, and I want you to be in it. What part will you to be? And I'm thinking, about, now I think about it, I'm just like, that's so crazy. But I always wanted to be an ape. Mm. Well, it, it was cool makeup. I was always a Chuck Heston fan. Uh and you know what? I, I kind of like that old school. They did some remakes, and mm -hmm. yeah, it looks cool, but there was something about that yeah. those originals. Absolutely. And uh, you remember the Halloweens with the little the costumes and the plastic face masks? And I Cooper. Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no? Oh, that's too funny. We probably so, have a lot of the same pop culture kind of influences. You know, I, I miss those days of Saturday morning cartoons. Oh, and, yeah. And things are things are definitely different now. Absolutely. They really are. But I can also tell that neither of us have grown up. No, no. Definitely haven't. You know, and I've made <laughs> it this far, so that that's you can't catch me now. That's right. <laughs> which which going through now, the people who have seen your films, there, there, there's you know, a laundry list of them. Um, but some of the ones that I've seen. Like I go through and I look at them and then see pictures of you online. And I was mentioning earlier before we went live, I'm like, I'm, I'm wondering what the look of DJ is going to be today because you might have the fastest growing hair of a human being I've ever seen because there's times your hair can be this length or it's like way down here. So you never know what DJ is going to be looking like. But I always I, like as I'm watching, I, I like I kind of laugh and chuckle. I'm like, which one of these is truly DJ? Because I can sense there's a. And I, will, I was going to say a sprinkle, but after talking to you now for 10, 15 minutes, it's bigger than a sprinkle of you in your characters. Depending on which character it is. You know, I, I think there's a little bit of, uh, you know, that's what we infuse into it. You know, some actors make a career of just being themselves, more or less. Yeah. Um, I've always admired the actors that lose themselves a little bit in the role. And sometimes people, is that the same actor? Mm. You know, that's that's always fascinating to me because it's like becoming someone else, not sure. just acting. You know, I, I, I was kind of talking to some uh, up and coming actors. The, the funny thing is, is that you can miss your line, but you can't truly make a mistake if mm. you embody the character. Right. You know, and that's a big fear for a lot of actors. Oh, I'm going to make a mistake. No, you own it. If you are that character, there is no mistake. You might be giving them footage they can't use because <laughs> mm -hmm. it doesn't edit together, but right. you're not making a mistake, you know, if you're in your if you're in your lane. So um yeah, I'm a person that definitely has I and it's not even really intentionally, you know. Sometimes I'll love I'll love a character and afterwards when I start to work on it 
Paul Landings and Man's Best Friend. I'm like, oh my goodness, what did I write for myself? You know, what did I, what challenge is this? You know, not to mention you take it very serious when you're representing someone else, you know. Mm-hmm. Playing a Civil War soldier, all those soldiers are deceased and you're kind of playing for the spirit of those men. Right. But it's different when you're, you know, playing an, uh, an ambulance driver, or a fireman. You want to give justice to the job that they do and be realistic with it. So, um, you know, I, I, I take that very serious, the character building on, on all the roles. Well, how about when you end up playing a role of Jesus? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Yeah, that, you know, that was, um, I was scared up until I accepted that, you know, because there's a few roles for me that were just kind of like, it would be so hard to tackle. Mm -hmm. Jesus was one of them. Elvis was one of them. Uh, You know, those are the two big ones that come to mind (laughs) right away. Jesus and Elvis, that's kind of funny. But, uh, you know, just that subjectively there's going to be people that look at denominations in religion and organized religion can't get along they can't yeah. agree to things so you know anything that you're doing interpretation wise and again you're just you're telling a story it's kind of um there there's a power to storytelling mm-hmm. You know, I used to always tell people if we make a bad scene or something like that, nobody dies on an operating table. Um, But I realized during the lockdown how powerful our medium is. Mm. You know, know, home video watching went up 30, 40 percent. I'm sure people's uh, darkness and depression went up by probably an equal amount. And I had more fan mail from all the movies come in. Wow. In, a, in a much greater amount. And people had time on their hands, so they wrote just these beautiful messages about, you know, what a certain character that they related to or a, a message that they pulled out of a film, be it Wild Faith or 40 Nights. And and I really started to realize, again, you know, the, the power that we do have to help people. Mm. And because of how our industry is, that a bunch of artists come together and put this piece of art together and then we put it out to the world we don't get that immediate feedback Mm -hmm. you know when you have something like a lot of our films have had tens of millions of views on it but in our own little social circle you know three to five thousand people maybe right we never we never meet all these other people sure and you don't always know how someone that was just in a you know, someone watches Lost Heart and they're in a dark place. I've had people say how, you know, it, it I don't want to say save their life, but that's some of the words from some of these people. That's a heavy thing to put on you. Well, yeah, I'm glad the story worked out. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you, you, you got that from it. So, you know, in to bring it back around to the, the Jesus thing, uh, I am that that was kind of a crown gem in a sense, in that. Um, only a handful of actors have ever done that. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we all experienced a similar kind of reverence going into that. And, um, you you, you know, so I think I'm kind of happy to have done it (laughs) rather than to have it lying before me. But, um, I, I do love those films and, and the quest trilogy, which is the, there's three of them. And so sometimes if someone just sees Chasing the Star, the second one, out of context, it doesn't get the review that when people Mm -hmm. understand, oh, it's part two of uh, 40 Nights Chasing the Star, the Christ Slayer. Right. And, uh, you know, then there's people that won't, that don't really gravitate to the films just because of the topic and nature of it. Mm Mm-hmm. Which, you know, I think there's a lot of people that become anti-religious because of things that are done by people, you know, and that sometimes reflects back on the teaching. You know, people aren't Mm -hmm. condemning all these other philosophers because they don't have disciples doing 
questionable things, <laughs> you know, while while wearing this moniker. So I, I think I think there's um you know there's a lot we just the the beautiful thing with these movies is there's no debate. You just are putting something out there and then leaving it with people. And it's not supposed to redefine anything. It's supposed to stimulate debate and thought. And for some people, you know, things make sense for the first time, you mm -hmm. know. So these fil those films are, are interesting because from uh, right after Halloween, November 1st, all the way through Easter, that's kind of the window for those films because everyone gets holy around the holidays, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we're right on the cusp of that season there. But, uh, you know, we have, we have entertainment for, for everyone. And going back to those films, I think they can be enjoyed no matter what your walk is or no walk. Mm -hmm. You know, I sure. think they're, they're beautiful stories with, with uh, themes to it that you can derive something from it, which CDI tries to do that often, you know, without being heavy handed, we, we take on very serious topics mm -hmm. as a writer. I think we go right up to that edge of uncomfortableness and then kind of let you off with some humor, you know, and allow us to laugh at ourselves a little bit. But, um, yeah, I think that's part of the power of storytelling as well. You know, you got people of opposing views arguing at one another. Nobody's really listening. There's no good communication there. Mm -hmm. Even if one person is is in the right, the other person shuts down. They don't want to hear it. They want yeah. to hit you with a big stick because you're just being condescending. You know, so storytelling is beautiful because the lights come down, people relax and and if you get them in that place of entertaining, then you can sometimes float a float float a idea out there, you know, float a, a way of thinking out there. And and it does. I think it's received better because art is one of the last few forms of um, communication. Mm. You know, it's it's really sad that you know people they just don't communicate well. And then if they get tired of trying to communicate. And they separate into their sides. That doesn't help either. So I'm really proud that at Collective Development, the art artists are all different backgrounds, you know. Well, the, the interesting thing with, with, with that is, I mean, you have your, your, your nucleus of um, your team that's in your films. And I, I think it, it shows truly the range of talent between all of you when you're like, like, like we said, like in one movie, you're playing Jesus. And then the next movie you're playing Gil, you know, from uh, <laughs> best years gone. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, oh, it just, man. it just shows this wide range of talent. And also too, it can show even uh, the average fan, the, the true world of acting. And yeah. how it's not like a person will watch a sitcom for 13 seasons and fall in love with that one person, a character. And then that's what they're going to see them for, for the rest of their life, where they're seeing you guys in all these different roles. And then. Right. Well, that was kind of a fear as a young actor. You know, first off, there was a few opportunities that could have led into soap opera. I didn't want to touch that. Okay. Um, there are people that have escaped that gravity. But I think mm -hmm. people become, back in the day, people would become comfortable, usually fall in love. And, you know, next sure. thing you know, like couples would basically ride out entire life and career on As the World Turns or General right. Hospital or whatnot. And uh, you kind of see that Hallmark is kind of replacing mm -hmm. uh, the soap opera, you yes. know, same sort of deal. <clears throat> and I never wanted to get stuck into a role that, well, one, you know, I've met a lot of people that have trouble escaping that one role. Sure. You know, you've got a lot of your classic TV actors, you mm -hmm. know, from, you know, Happy Days, Gilligan's Island, the Brady Bunch. You know, some of these people, it was really hard for them to break out and be someone else. So, no, that is a special thing that, you know, you're not kind of painted in a... And I respect people like Christopher Guest and the whole Spinal Tap and mm -hmm. 
And, you know, they've gone best in show and waiting for Guffman. <clears throat> I think there's so many talented people in that group and they all take turns shifting where either it's an ensemble or these are the stars of this one. And these people play supporting. And that's kind of what we do at CDI. Um, and then, of course, we have a lot of people that guest in. Mm -hmm. And as the word gets out how much fun we have and what the final product is, we have more and more people that want to want to come play so that's and that's uh that's cool that's very cool i mean that's how this whole uh connection with me and you guys happened was from uh our happy days connection of donnie most or don oh, yeah yeah and I, i've i've known don for years and interviewed <clears throat> him quite a few times and i saw he had post actually it was on linkedin the trailer for lost heart and i was i was like sucked in. i was like wow i gotta check this movie out and then I watched it and I reached out to him. I'm like, yo, I got to talk to you about this movie. I, 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 I was so, I've so fallen in love with that movie and the whole story. And I was just like, wow, it was yeah. so deep and intense. He's so good in that film. And it, it's funny because uh, I really believe that good storytellers have the ability to do like what Tarantino did. He'll, he'll reinvent an actor. They're not just staying relevant. Yeah. It is showing a new side to Don Most. And Don got quite a bit of work in the wake of that in Man's mm -hmm. Best Friend, the film we did beforehand. And, you know, he said, you know, he's been at conventions and people come up and are <clears throat> saying how much they like Lost Heart, which we also call Bigfoot UFOs and Jesus. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, <clears throat> I started getting fan mail from a lot of men that were forced to watch this movie called Lost Heart. And they enjoyed it. Because it had Bigfoot and UFOs and the mystery and the comedy. And so when we were having a marketing meeting with our distributor, I said, I, I'm i pretty sure we would sell a million more if this thing was called <laughs> something like Bigfoot, UFOs, and Jesus. Because I just, you know, the, there's the, the sad kind of cover and it's lost heart. And it's like, how many mm -hmm. of you, if it's just a bunch of guys sitting around, and they're flipping through. What's the chance right. of them pressing play on that? But Bigfoot UFOs and Jesus, it's like, I don't know. But we got to check them out. <laughs> I, so, I think I even, when, the first time I interviewed Melissa, I think I even said that to her. I'm like, how can you not love a, a movie that has Bigfoot UFOs and Jesus in it? <laughs> well, you know what? And I think like foreign wise, I'm not sure how it translates in all the languages, but they have to be the three big words that most people know. You know, so it, it, it's it been that was a that's a nice experiment and it still is running. And I've had to tell a few people, no, don't rent that again. It's yes, it is. It's lost heart. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it's just it's truth. You know, I, I probably would not have clicked on lost heart. But <laughs> Bigfoot UFOs and Jesus, you can bank on it that I would have had. <laughs> to now, out. now, me, I, I definitely like. As in, like just the other night, like I, I, I'm always crying. I don't know. I'm, I've had a rough life. So I sit here, whether I'm watching TV shows, I'm watching movies, I'm watching uh, music on, on YouTube. Just the other night, I'm sitting here and, and my girlfriend comes in and I'm sitting here crying. She's like, what's the matter now? What are you crying for? I'm like, I'm watching uh, Led Zeppelin being honored at the, the Kennedy thing from years ago. And every time I watch it, I cry, but I'm like, you can't yeah. stand with or I'm heart, watching with heart singing. Yes, yes. I'm like I'm watching Robert Plant cry, and it's making me cry. So, <laughs> well, because they've done great things, and they're they're reflecting back. And I I think, mm -hmm. you know, there there is kind of uh, an immortality, you know, at least until, <laughs> until the resolution runs out. These, these films, you know, I've already got films that um, are decades old that are still being enjoyed, and they will. I mean, we've lost good friends already, you know, mm -hmm. actors and stuff along the way. And to me, I see that as a passing of the torch, you know, that as these sure. legends die, a lot of us don't see ourselves as legends. We're just journeymen, storytellers, mm -hmm. but it's time to pick up that torch and yeah. keep telling stories and telling unique stories and powerful stories. And, mm -hmm. and so... Like I said, I only had one Hollywood mentor, and that was Rance Howard, Ron Howard's father. Okay. I, my first mentor was my father. I've had good business mentors, <clears throat> but Rance Howard was my only 
mentor that was in the business and wow. I couldn't have asked for a better one for 12 years. You know, he was such a down to earth man. He knew everyone. And if you ever wanted a true answer, not the Hollywood BS, mm-hmm. you know, that was where I would go. And so he's missed. He's, he's greatly missed from a few years ago now. Sure. But mentors are important. That's, that's, I think. And, and now that we're getting older, you know, I'm mentoring other people, other mm-hmm. new branches on the CDI tree. You know, we've had several different, uh, you know, groups come up. You know, we're always, we're, well, some have retired. The business is broke, a few of them, you know, I'm sure. I'm it happens. Sure. And I'm talking about just physically, you know, people, it's, it's hard work. And yeah. people, they only see the glamorous stuff, you know, mm-hmm. it's that's, that's a couple nights out of the year, the rest <laughs> of it driving to studios and having your brain scrambled, watching footage go backwards and forwards and looking for glitches. And, you know, there's, there's a lot to it. We, I, I was talking to someone this morning and it's like, either you got the disease of storytelling or you don't, if you can be happy doing anything else. You might want to try that, but if not, welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so the whole storytelling, the, the writing these stories and, and writing these movies, did you ever want to get into possibly writing books or anything, or was it always about writing um, movies? You know, even in high school, instead of paying attention and taking notes like I should have, I was always preparing scripts and outlines and storyboarding for stuff that we were going to shoot after school or on the weekend (laughs) or whatnot. And that just kind of, you know, carried on. And uh, the writing, I've always enjoyed reading and writing. Um, You know, it's one of those things that uh, the, the script, it was always filmed. Like I did not come up through the stage. I never had a desire to be on the stage. It was me and a group of friends with a camcorder, Mm. you know, and the few times that, uh, and I got a lot of theater friends and I love them, you know, they, they're, uh, but it's a different beast, you know, and even in high school drama club, you know, I was not going to be wearing panties on my head and paint my nose blue for some sort of silly initiation so I could do some of their theater games and stuff. It was never, uh, you know, in college, I, I was at an acti- acting 101 for uh, a few minutes and then I walked out. I just did. It wasn't for me. I did end up taking I had one really strong instructor at Michigan State University named Joyce Ramsey that uh, she had been she dated Johnny Carson and she had been, you know, she had done some screen and some stage and. She she told me that I was diamond in the rough. I could play the gas station attendant or the leading man. But damn it, when I left her class, I was going to be a better actor than when I came in. She was wow. going to refine me. And she was hard on me. And uh, she's she's the only acting teacher other than just my own imagination and love to make believe and become hmm. my dedication to that. And, and really what she helped learn was scene study, how to work with a partner in okay. talking through and then bringing out the best performance together versus just yourself. And learning that when you get to being natural, that's only the first step. You want to be interesting. Mm. You know, a lot of actors work for a long time just to get natural. Yeah. But then... You know, the real, the ones that go far, the ones that always make interesting choices, you know, the Joaquin Phoenixes of this world, mm-hmm. you know, that's, uh, so that, that's kind of there, you know, again, you know, from the acting point of view, Joyce, you know, mentors like Rance, like I said, there's all people that have kind of helped us along, sure. the right? The writing has always been something. And, and for the first decade or so you know i i i did some co-writing with some people and i also helped produce and act in some other people's work it really wasn't until you know just the last uh what 15 years that my scripts really came to the forefront and started being produced 
you know, which, which is, you know, if it's a good story, I, I can, I can work on someone else's dream sure. you know, story, someone's vision. And that's the other thing I don't direct, you know, I don't, not that I couldn't, I just, it's not a hat that I want to wear. It's not, I like to help put the circus on and then play my character. And you know, <laughs> a man has got to know his limitations. <laughs> Well, how about, I mean, because you guys do just uh, films, movies, uh, documentaries you told me you, you, you're getting involved with. Um, but with this now, you know, the world of streaming and all, was there, is there, or will there be any uh, series? like? You know, Wild Faith, which is our, our Western interracial little house on the prairie, is my one-line pitch. Uh, it's done very well for us. You know, it took in a lot of awards it's the one that you know tens of millions of people man's best friend and wild faith just went to peacock nbc a few oh, months wow. ago and when we when the covid lockdown first came i wrote season one i wrote eight 44 minute episodes okay that are the follow-up to wild faith huh. and you know, filmmaking, I've got so many different pieces on the board, but none of them gelled enough together to get the series off yet. Off gotcha. the ground. But it's it's a it's a cool series because, again, it's a throwback to the Waltons and Little House on the Prairie and the life and times of Grizzly Adams and mm -hmm. the stuff that influenced me where it was real character development and real stories. And there was kind of a message or something that you learned and it's like you tricked me you didn't even i learned something but i know that i was learning something. <laughs> was all over and so i i really do hope to see that get off the ground um those characters are great in there and so i'm not opposed to the longer format it just uh I think it kind of saved, you know, a lot of our younger people are having attention span problems, you know, yeah. and these mini series kind of forced them to wait and re-engage with characters. Cause even there was a time where editing was just going so fast paced, mm. you know, gone were the Hitchcock long moments drawn out, letting, you know, tension and suspense and stuff sit in and right. You know, so it's kind of like finding a happy in between these days on things. So. Which makes me and now I have to ask with the you mentioning the short attention span of the generation today. What's your thoughts on this whole world of TikTok that's happening? I, you know, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't have that TikTok. size said it all. Well, you know what? Yeah. It, it, What's a ticket tacky thing? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't have TikTok. At one of our meetings, they opened a CDI TikTok. I, it's being managed by, uh, I think, Shane Hagedorn. Um, yeah, you know, I, I already have communications that come in. It's like, did that come in LinkedIn or some messenger or texting or email? or Where did this message come from? I already have too much going on so it's just even like our, our the streaming thing i'm glad it was pressed and there at work because you know first it's skype then i get that figured out and they go to zoom and then not zoom now it's teams now te stream yard what <laughs> so I, you know what i've got an old tsr 80 processor oregon <laughs> trail press the tape recorder and i'm sure i gotta con constantly delete important things so i can <laughs> yesterday it, it was noted that i knew all the lyrics to the cartoon hong kong fooey number one but, super guy yes absolutely <laughs> but, but you know at what cost what did i forget something else had to be deleted you know uh... technology it's an it's an interesting age you know i i just hope i can make it to my lifetime you know through my lifetime and and stay at least up with what I need to. But so yes, I got nothing on TikTok. I love it. Do they love me? TikTok? Do they like CDI? Uh, okay. But you know, I, I do. I do know enough that there's people getting out of their moving cars to dance or something while their mm. their car runs into something. I wouldn't advise that. 
Yeah, all for a TikTok video. When you get your collision bill, <laughs> you know you. <laughs> I did a lot of dumb things too when I was young, so I can't throw too many stones. But no, I, I don't TikTok. Although I think you know you could make some interesting TikTok videos out of a mm. few of the characters, probably. Yeah, I don't know. Someone's got more time than I do. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, the one movie that's next on my plate, which I, you mentioned a few times, which I, I when I saw the preview last night, I was like, wow, okay. This is this one's really going to go deep, and I probably going to end me in tears again. Man's mm. best friend. Man's best friend. Um, veterans have really responded well to that film. It's about our wounded veterans, and it's about adoption dogs and mm -hmm. parallels between them. And uh, yes, I I would be surprised if you can get through it without having a few tearful moments, especially if you have a soft spot for animals. I saw your cat crawling around on you, so I know you are. I think I think that film, you'd enjoy it. And um, that that movie was 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 probably my hardest movie to date. And people are surprised to hear that because Jesus and everything else. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing is, is I studied you know, thousands of hours of wounded vets, both in the hospitals being treated and then trying mm. to integrate back home sure. and the de dealing with depression and darkness and everything else, because it's very important. You're going to be a spokesperson in a way with this. Right. Story. But what was really hard for me is um, during pre-production, just before we started shooting uh, my boy, Luke Brown, my furry, bro my furry boy, was diagnosed with cancer mm. and uh you know so and i didn't know if that was meaning a week or a month and you know we ended up having him for you know a good part of a year we treated okay. him and fought that battle you know with everything we had you know people think we we're crazy because oh you're gonna spend that kind of money on it's that's what that movie's about they're not just property they're family yeah, yeah. they're family and you know, people that abuse or are cruel to animals, you better recognize that for some mm -hmm. people, you are messing with fire if you're messing with their animals. Absolutely. And that's kind of some of the lessons in there. But what made that film so hard is that when the movie wrapped and everybody was cheering and everybody, I got to go back to being DJ Perry and even though the character when you see the character i was playing a mild version of the character hmm. and there's people that they don't get to turn it off they either they have to deal right. with it for the rest of their lives or they become the next suicide statistic hmm. and so <clears throat> that movie i watched the you know the premiere and stuff i still have not watched the film all the way through or anything since uh the premiere wow yeah i can't say that about you know uh several of the other films because if there's a relative or someone wants to see something you know but uh that film was hard because because of that because sure. it, because it was so it so honestly represents people out there that are suffering and you know, I did my job, I think, calling attention to it with this powerful story. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of like survivor's guilt that you get to turn it off and go back to being normal. Right. But you know how these you you spent this time embodying this character and these other people are dealing with that and they don't get to turn it off. Turn there it is off. Yeah. no there is no rap. That's that's you know, we're done. So. You know, and we had guys like Bobby Henline in there who you'll see he was he survived uh, car bomb mm -hmm. and he was badly burnt. And, and you know, he's a comedian and he's a motivational speaker and he's had so many surgeries. It's just incredible. So wow. uh, that, that's that's not just a fictional film. That's you know, it's based on nonfiction. Yeah. You know, Paul might not be any one person, but he represents a lot of people. Sure. So, 
Wow. So yeah, do check it out. I mean, it's it, it like I said, it's a little heavy. It might not be your favorite go to to watch, but you'll be happy you did watch it. Yeah, I mean, I, I was again like going back to like the the Lost Heart. Like I, it was first off, I had to, I'd seen the posters and stuff like that, you know, in, in your uh, social medias and all. But when I actually sat and watched the trailer, it's like that's not what I was expecting at all. So then I was like, whoa, this is a very deep, heavy subject that's being tackled here and mm-hmm. yeah that and, and your movies do e- even what the uh, i want to talk about next um best year's gone mm-hmm. for as goofy and crazy and dark as it gets at times there is a lot of good messages of life throughout it oh yeah you know i was kind of disappointed that because of the outer shell of that film like the distributor uh they didn't see it being submitted to any of these uh, more of the faith festivals or ones that, that promote or inspire people. Mm-hmm. And it does have that at the heart. It's about stand by your woman, no matter. It's a, it's a crazy love story. Oh, it, it is. And, you know, we just showed in Cleveland, Ohio at this indie gathering. And uh, we had accepted a few awards there. And after the screening, the best was this guy who came up who had been uh, AA sober 19 years. Mm. And he just loved how that film showcased and represented people with an alcohol problem. And that he thinks that film is going to be well received and will help many people struggling with, you know, sobriety because they and alcohol don't mix well, mm-hmm. you know, because for some people, they just shouldn't drink. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, I got alcoholics on both sides of the family. Most people do, you know? So I think that's why Best Years Gone connects is that we all know a Gil Gillis in our circles around us. And if you don't, then you might be that Gil Gillis. (laughs) You know, so Uh, if you don't see him in your immediate group, then that you might be him. You might want to look in the mirror. (laughs) So, so what's the actual next movie that's going to be coming out for you guys? Uh, the next movie is actually For the Love of Catch, which is our feature-length okay. doc film on the history of an uh, art form called Catch Can. I'll try to put it in a nutshell. Pre-World War One, the two top sports in the United States were boxing and wrestling. Mm. You know, And these matches would go on for hours against yeah. the guys that uh you know sometimes it was how many falls and stuff like that but after world war one uh some of the desire from the public for violence and brutality started to kind of you know they had had their fill especially the people returning from war and so the catch can champion at that time uh was assigned by the president to teach hand-to-hand combat at west point military academy hmm And a lot of his students ended up spreading out across the country, going to teach as phys ed students and collegiate wrestling started to be born in all its different forms. Uh, Now, the other wrestling was the Kearney circuit where mm -hmm. they still would go around and challenge from place to place. Well, and in these territories, someone usually stood out head and shoulders above the others. And in a real wrestling match, Mm -hmm. This person wasn't going to lose unless they wanted to lose. Mm -hmm. And they would a lot of times, sometimes it was to fight a a champion from another territory, but a lot of times it was challenging people from the crowd and they would just, you know, try your luck for this amount. And they, they put them, make them submit out one after another, one after another. And so, you know, it, it was kind of like when these guys wanted to take time off to go spend with family they would drop the belt to the next guy knowing that they could tour on as the champion and they could come back and get it anytime they want to, because we Mm -hmm. can have a legit match when I come back and I'll take it from you, you know? So that became kind of a drop the belt sort of courtesy thing. And that Mm -hmm. it's fascinating because, you know, like I said, from the martial arts to being a pro wrestling fan my whole life. And you, you know, you knew that some of the, the, the techniques you know, could be really painful. I mean, I remember my buddy and I trying to get each other in the figure four. <laughs> <laughs> the, the and so, 
you know, I, I'm excited because, like I said, there's no excuse that this history is not known, that there's people that are that are legit champions, that their coaches were never able to fill in those blanks because their coach never filled in the blanks. Right. And so I think that this, for the love of catch, we have in a premiere in Owasso, Michigan, at the NCG Theaters on October 1st, and then it comes out October 4th. Okay. On streaming and DVD. So like Amazon Prime, Google Play, iTunes, and then later goes to the ad based stuff like Tubi and, and everything. Okay. But but I think it's gonna be a big deal because like if I was a coach, you'd want your team to sit down and watch this. If you were an mm -hmm. enthusiast of any of these circles, because it shows where Brazilian Jiu Jitsu ties in and all these different art forms stemming from yeah. equal trees. So it's it's great and and it's coming right from you know these guys that just they've dedicated their whole life to this art mm -hmm. you know josh what is a josh burnett the war master or something like that he's they, they they've just got dan severin the beast you know i know dan and you know what and they do it in some really fun ways because Curran jacobs you know, he, he's our director. He has been a former catch can champion, world champion. There's some video when he won this one champion because there's no weight classes. You know, he's like 190, but he fought monsters, several of them in a row with little rest time in between. And uh, I remember because I was late going into a class reunion watching this and I'm just like, wow. But he, he pulled this together, and we've got a lot of people, like I said, not all of them are friends, but they all love this, mm -hmm. you know, grappling art that is developed. And so we've got some wonderful uh, stuff nobody's ever seen, history no one's ever heard, stuff about Abraham Lincoln, and, really? That's you cool. know, where he fought and everything. So I think people that are into it, either a little bit or a lot of it, you're going to enjoy it. So get a nice little history lesson. Yeah, that's the next one coming out. And then in December, uh, Silent Night in Algona is okay. our World War II Christmas film. And we're hard at work composing music and sound design and color grading and VFX and trying to get that ready for December. We're going to premiere it in the place that we shot it. And they'll go on. And then a couple weeks after that, it'll start playing theaters across the Midwest. Wow. Because there was Germans kept in prisoner of war camps all across the Midwest. Hmm. Thousands and thousands of them. And people don't know this. You know, our labor, uh, all our manpower was fighting. So the canneries, like Hormel, Spam, and stuff like that, yeah. Pioneer, they started using the Germans in the factories. Well, then the farmers started having trouble as well. And our story kind of focuses on, you know, the idea of desperation bringing about, we might need these boys to work on these farms. Well, cannery is one thing, but at home with your family, your kids right. and your wife, that's uh, that caused some real debate at some dinner tables. Mm. And so all true events that this is based upon and... Um, we're excited for that one. Hmm. Well, again, it's preserving history. Yeah. The, the good, yeah. the bad, and the ugly. Not not waxing over it. But see, it's also the German people are loving the story because um, a lot of Germans have had to live with this. All Germans from the 40s are Nazis somehow. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of like if you were a farmer in the 1800s in the South, you were a slave owner. That's mm -hmm. not how it was. Right. You know, so... I think they're going to like that distinction, but there's also a cautionary tale that bad things can be done even when a small portion of the populace is in charge or takes charge. Right. So, again, a lot of good lessons in it. And uh, then at, we'll play it in theaters as long as it will go into 23, and then it'll go quiet for a few weeks, and then we're going to start prepping it for the ramp up for the home video release leading into Christmas 23 crazy how far in advance you work with these things wow well i mean it's it's wild because like i see like when i go through like you know your mills and imdb and you see this stuff and you're like wow this thing was like filmed like five years ago and it's now just finally coming out it's like so weird 
Well, you know, that's not usually how it is with these films. Uh, we had one recently bestseller mm-hmm. that, uh, that Melissa Ann Schutz was the star of, and it's a thriller. And we were one of three companies that worked, collaborated on it. And it was all financed by the author himself. He's been very successful with his books as a children's author. Okay. Jonathan Rand. Uh, American Chillers, Adventure Club, kind of like the Hardy Boys, three investigator stuff mm-hmm. we grew up with. But he really wanted to be, you know, a Stephen King. So he has okay. written some material that way. And that's what bestseller is, is one of his adult fiction movies. Mm. And he was, he's got his own shop. He's got his own warehouses. So he was distributing DVDs and selling through his shop. And he tours, you know, almost 200 days a year to schools and stuff and book signings. And, but, you know, streaming came along and he realized he, he didn't have the ability to tap into that. So Mm. We opened it up with um, Desk Pop, and they're releasing to the rest of the world. So, nice. so normally there there wouldn't be that gap, but it was kind of like he, you know, he's also one of those guys that did it without going the conventional way, you know, handling his own distribution. Mm-hmm. But he realized he wasn't going to be able to handle streaming, sure, and all its its, and it was just income that he wasn't getting, so. And it's fans of the film that we weren't getting. So now, now I think it's going to get a much larger audience. Do you get a chance to see that one? As I told Mel, movies like that and me don't sit well. So I, I'm very nervous to watch this one. Mm-hmm. So uh, it, it's going to be on my plate in the very near future. But yeah, it makes me very, yeah. It, it is. It's tense. But, Especially but it's when all, it's somebody you know. <laughs> okay, but yeah. it's, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, you know what? I think in, in some ways it's the closest to a Hitchcock film that we've made, both in atmosphere and... But it does go more intense. Starts off a little slow, but then once it gets going, watch out. Yeah. You have such a grin on your face like a kid. <laughs> like... <laughs> Yeah, you know, I might have a little bit of a prankster side still. <laughs> if you talk to people on set, there might be the occasional, you know, rubber spider or something. We'll find that way. <laughs> like I said, you know, it's a 10 year old still. You know, you, you got to still love it. If it, when you stop loving it, man, that's when it's, you, you don't want to be doing it. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. so. Best Year's Gone, you know, and Best Seller, two very different films. Both kind of came out in the same, I think, a month apart. But, uh, yeah, Best Year's Gone, I think, I had a great experience uh, last, what was it? It was uh, Saturday night. I got invited to be a guest at a private party that they're having out on a property way out in, um, across from this Christmas tree farm. It was a barn party. But when I say it's a barn... It's got a bar and booths and a stage and, Hmm. you know, they've been, they've been doing this for 20 years and they actually were raising money for people that have been incarcerated because of marijuana charges, because it's all recreational and everything is legal in Michigan and they've gotten 600 people off, you know, but there's still a bunch stuck in the system. And uh, the one guy is, um, he's an attorney and his wife's an artist and he has a small um, piece of the the Silent Night in Algona, the World War II picture. Okay. As an investor. But went out there and, you know, was just getting to meet some people. He had this uh, Darren McCarthy from the Red Wings and he had, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Leif was performing. He was an American Idol performer kind of a bluesy okay. rock guy and so you know went out there to kind of help their cause and i hadn't been out there in 20 years and everything but i ended up uh just standing at this table with a guy who was visiting from detroit who had came to just network and everything and he asked how i knew the host of the party and i said through the film the world war ii film and everything and he said so your films they come out on what like tubi and stuff like that i said actually i Two of them came out on Tubi last week, you know, best years gone and bestseller. 
He's like, oh, yeah, I've, I've seen that one. I said, which one? He said, best year's gone. I said, no. I said, get out of here. You have not. I said, if you did, you're going to have made my night. He goes, it did. There was uh, race cars and some twins. He goes, you got a poster? I was, Let me see if it's the same one. Isn't there IMDB? I'm like, oh, yeah. I pull it out. He's like, yeah, that's the film. He's pointing at Gil. He goes, that guy right there, he's the lead of the film. I said, you don't say. <laughs> you know, the next thing you know, I said, you know, so can you get drunk on that beer? Next thing you know, he looks at the picture, he looks at me. It was one of those moments where, you know, it's fun to watch someone just be knocked off their seat. He just realized that, you know, <laughs> that he was talking to that guy. So, you know. Like I said, we don't always get to meet our fans, so it's it's See, nice now for that, once in a while. That clip, though, about the light beer, that's a TikTok moment. That clip alone should just be put on TikTok. Well, Tiki Taka, then. Come on. Tiki Taka, come on. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Gil, Gil, Gil is – he was a lot of fun to play. And, you know, of course – I've got certain directors that said, you know, I really should have really pushed more into comedy because I did a lot of heavy drama stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now people have responded well off that, you know, we took a few awards and this and that. And, you know, it's like, oh, my <laughs> God, great. This will be the one that really breaks through. And, you know, but, <laughs> but ever since, you know, poor Ernest passed away, Ernest goes to camp. Ernest yeah. Goes to yeah, there's been a gap in the marketplace. <laughs> so Gil's, gonna, Gil's, Gil's gonna fill the gap. What, yeah, <laughs> fill the gap. Go, Gil. Oh my goodness. Well, uh, and you know what? Terrible. We that was during we shot that during the the COVID lockdown, and I mean the second lockdown where they shut everything down happened the day after we wrapped. So we were really, you know, there's a guiding hand on that, and no one got sick. Our protocol wow. caught three people before they came on set, but uh, we just we just wanted to make people laugh, you know, because everyone was very heavy yeah. and unsure, and that was easily the most fun we had making it, the most fun that year, and now to see people enjoying it is uh, that's the best, you know. That's why that's why the artists do it is for people <laughs> to enjoy it. Now, now you need a part two. Gil strikes back. <laughs> well, you know they go back into racing. You know it's now it's you think you think Gil's the nice guy and and you know but yes his brother or his cousin there Ike Ike Gillis yeah <laughs> it, that is a fun movie it really is and it could play to a sequel there could be. You know what? It's funny we're talking about because I think a lot of characters are worthy of sequels, just like we talked about the Hastings, the Wild Faith TV series. Mm -hmm. But the only character I've ever played more than once has been Jesus. See that? And, and I mean, let's face it, he does deserve more than a sequel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there could be another one still. <laughs> but uh, anyways, it's... It is. It's a, It's amazing. I tell people all the time, it's kind of like being in the minor leagues in a sport. You know, I, mm -hmm. I get to make a living doing what I love. And that in itself is a blessing, you know, because uh, I would die in a cubicle. I'm with you. You know, so. And I think a lot of people are starting to pursue more and more things that make them happy, you know, things totally. that give them joy. So I think uh, the pandemic taught many, many people that it did. It's there's there's a there's a change underway. You know, some of it good, some of it bad, but change is, and that's all a subjective opinion. You know, for some, sure. I think that that's the that's something interesting to bring up. You know, I think some of the, the divisiveness between people is that it's when people are trying to play for an absolute win. That's an extremist view, mm -hmm. either side. You know, I'm a moderate person that we all have priorities and I'm willing to give up some of my priorities so someone else can have some of theirs. And if if their party was in power, I wish they'd do the same thing. Or, you know, there. I think you need to be striving for a balance, not domination. 
And that's that's kind of where things are at with that. The people want to win all. You know, they want to go for all the cookies. Uh, there's nothing wrong with getting all the cookies. Well, <laughs> he who has all the cookies. I don't know. I'll have to think on that one for a while, man. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so yeah, it's been our busiest year for releases. I think five movies this year. Because there's also a short we did a concept film called Smoke and Mirrors that we might release. It's a uh, steampunk turn of the century. Oh, it was cool. taken from a feature script. We had a commercial project where uh, the software company, Isotope, that does audio cleanup, mm -hmm. instead of them getting stock footage somewhere for their demonstrations across the country, probably across the world, we filmed footage for them, you know, movie footage that then they could use in their demos but i got them to agree to let us use the footage to make our kind of a concept video it gave us an idea you know smoke and mirrors so that that had a, a showing at this motor city nightmares this year and okay between best years gone and best seller that's three and four is the for the love of catch Mm -hmm. And five is Silent Night in Algona. So it's been a busy year. And when do you sleep? You know, actually, I sleep really well. And that's a secret that I think uh, I used to be a night owl. And now I'm a morning person. Hmm. I head to bed about 10, 1030. I read anywhere from five to 50 minutes. And that's a book, not technology. Hmm. Sometimes I just pretend I'm reading and shut my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, I'm up about 7, 7.15 pretty much every day. And I kind of like that because being up early is like being up late, but I got more energy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? What about you? Are you a late night or early person? Uh, late night. Late night, yeah. Yeah. Like the alarm started going off. I tried to do early today. The alarm started going off at like 7.30, but I didn't get out of bed till 9. Mm. And that's yeah. still kind of early. I got dogs that would be, you know, on me about that. So <laughs> <laughs> they're like, nope, I got food. I got to go outside. So, yeah. Yeah. So, all right, so let's uh, let's put it out there. Where is the best place to get hold of you, get hold of collective development, to see everything? What's Where's, where's the best place to go to learn? CDIproductions.com is our website. Of course, places like IMDB has all our films. That's a good place to put a review if you've seen our film and you want to leave us notes about your favorite character, favorite scene, or something imdb's nice um amazon prime carries almost all of our stuff pretty consistent so you can buy it rent it um you know i'm still a collector of dvds you know physical media is they can't take it away from you you can't crash you know that's to see how old i sound with that like, <laughs> what? well well how, how about this how about you know with the music industry, uh, vinyl has come back. And now, even tape cassettes are slowly making a little comeback. Would you guys ever, for nostalgia stake, release VHS? Uh, you know, VHS. Um, Not even DVD. Just v straight to VHS for, like, special uh, edition or something. Collect yeah, sure, collector's sure. edition. You know, and I do that. And the thing is, it's like, but I came... The novelty, I started in VHS, you know, just like we started in film. You know, I passed through there. I do like the Blu-ray as kind of like uh, the most information, best form of a film being stored with some extras. Um, but, you know, those kind of little extras, like I, I listen to albums, I listen to tapes. I got a media section and I my vinyl albums I've had my whole life and I... Mm -hmm pick up and collect some. I just got a whole bunch of James Bond soundtracks, which are pretty awesome. Nice. And, uh, you know, we've talked about releasing even like the, the best of the quest trilogy on LP. And, you know, so I'm going to do some more stuff like that. 
you know, I think merchandise, that's, again, you brought up Planet of the Apes, Planet of the Apes, you know, Star Wars, Close Encounters, all this stuff mm -hmm. stayed relevant because of the merchandising, too. Yep. And for me, that stuff is fun. So even if we can break even. You know, we need a talking Gildal. Look at man. We are open <laughs> to all licensing. Hasbro, call me. Come on. <laughs> We can, we can get him, uh, you know, get him. He, he's got his Escalade. He's got a Nova. Come on. Oh, man. And you can have Jesus with Kung Fu Grip. Yeah. And uh, Ben Lilly and Hester Thicket, you know, <laughs> action figures, lunch boxes. I will have a lunch box one day. Does, maybe, does it, maybe action figures. Uh, I'm telling I think I just, uh, I, I just put in motion the next major meeting at, over at CDI. Well, it just might be hey, action figures with this 3D printing stuff. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. So there you go. Next investment 3D printer. <laughs> <laughs> just as long as I don't have to run it. Right. There you go. Yeah. That, the TikTok person can also run the 3D printer. That's right. Shane's actually pretty good at technology. So. <laughs> So, any other questions? What else you've seen? A good amount of the stuff. That's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we're we're gonna we'll have to do another one for a, another release to do some more catch up and and talking and. Yeah, yeah, and we can get you some of the other members of the tribe out here. They'd have fun. Absolutely. You've had Melissa on here. Yeah. You know, she's a tough cookie, isn't she? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I, I got to do another one with her uh, if I can get the courage to watch bestseller. Yeah. Well, yeah, I won't say anything. We'll have more to talk about after. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I might be a little scarred after that one, but hey. Well, I think you can handle that. It's, you know, it could be worse. You know, I started in some of the horror films. I'm not a big gore person myself. Yeah. Not at you all. You know, Psycho is probably, if you were to ask me, is one of my favorite, you know, films that I watch around Halloween. Maybe The Birds. I like it when it was a, more up to the imagination. Yeah. Yeah. You know, hockey mask guy, you know, they're yeah. still trying to kill you. What's the difference, right? Yeah. I don't, I, why do I want to watch that? I don't want to, you can watch the news. Why do I need to watch that? The news is scarier. Exactly. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Be worried about that guy. Right there. <laughs> Forget about Freddy Krueger, right? Mm -hmm. Anyways. So, well, DJ, this has been amazing. A lot of fun. I, I, I could see me and you hanging out and uh, drinking some beers and talking about Planet of the Apes and Evil Knievel and Star Wars and everything else. You know what? And that's really the key. You know, it's like I haven't. I, this is just what I do. You know, <laughs> like I said, I think we're both those 10 year olds that have just found. Look at you're doing what you're doing. I'm doing what mm -hmm. I'm doing. Mm -hmm. We're definitely not. It doesn't feel like adult work, does it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not supposed to and I'll never make it. No, no. Well, hey, thank you so much, and I look forward to next time. This was great. Absolutely. Me too. All right. Take care, man. Great you have meeting you. Have a wonderful you. day. Bye -bye. You too. Bye. <laughs>